Good. So, yesterday we started talking about derivatives. Yeah, and we even calculated an example of a derivative. And it was a mess because we, all we had was a simple quadratic and we had to expand this limit using a lot of algebra. It was, I mean, frustrating because if you consider how many different polynomials there are, there's a lot to do. Right? And of course, if you don't want to just do polynomials, but rational functions, right? Quotients of polynomials, or even worse, exponentials, sine functions, right? Any trig function, a logarithm, anything, right? There's a lot to do. And if we did it one at a time, it would take us a while. Okay, so today we want to talk about some of the rules of differentiation that will reduce the problem to just being able to differentiate a few functions. And, well, what we're going to start with is a proof that continuity is going to be a consequence of differentiability, and that's why we really want to talk about only continuous functions. but we're at least going to make sure that some of these rules work and we'll definitely see this implication. So let's talk about it. So what did it mean for something to be differentiable? All right, well, let's, see. let's start. Let f of x be a function. Right, and we'll take some real number a. differentiable at x equals a if, well, we define the derivative in, term, some, in terms of a limit. And we said if that limit exists, then it is differentiable, and the value of that limit is the derivative. So if the limit as x goes to a of um, Okay, now we have this quotient. Uh, actually, not x goes to a, but h goes to 0. f of a plus h minus f of a divided by h. And we say if this limit exists. Okay, and I, I want to amend my definition here of exists. I mean, I that is, I want to clarify it. When I say this, I don't allow infinite limits in this case. Right? So when I say that this limit exists, I mean you really get a finite number out. Typically, when I say, you know, does a limit exist, I allow for the possibility that it's infinite. Okay, so we have definitions for that. But in this case, I really mean it has a true numerical limit. Okay, so that's what I mean if it's differentiable. Okay, so if I know that I have a function and it's differentiable at a point x equals a, then I know that this limit exists. Okay? So, so let the limit as h goes to 0 of f of a plus h minus f of a divided by h equal l. Okay, that's my limit. I want to show that the function is now continuous at the point x equals a. Okay, how do I do that? Well, I have to remember what it means to be continuous at the point x equals a. Okay, what did it mean to be continuous at x equals a? Well, right, remember you have these, this function and it's got a one side the limit coming from this side, one side the limit coming from this side. And continuity says that these limits, first, they should be the same, right, so the two sided limit exists. And the function should actually hit that target. Okay. So, the, or if you like, the limit hit the target. So, remember, continuity said not only do I target the weapons factory, I have to hit it. Okay. So, 
continuity says what? It says that the limit as x goes to a of f of x is equal to f of x, right? As I approach a from both sides, the limit exists, and it hits the target. So that's what I need to prove. So let's do a little computation. Let's start with the following. And leave a little room on the side. Okay, so I have the limit as h goes to 0, I have f of a plus h minus f of a over h. And it equals, leave a little bit of room, it equals l. Okay. I'm going to multiply both sides by the limit as h goes to 0 of h. Okay? Of course, if I do it to one side, I better do it to the other. Does it make sense to multiply by a limit? Well, if the limit exists, then it's some number. And so it's okay, I can multiply by a number. If it doesn't exist, can you multiply by something that doesn't exist? No. So I, I certainly should make sure that I'm, this limit exists. And of course, what is the limit of h goes to 0 of h? Is it 0 or 1? It's 0, right? Of course, if h goes to 0, h goes to 0. Okay, no problem. Okay, so it's okay. This limit exists, so I can multiply. Yeah, I mean, really, I'm just multiplying by 0. Not hurting anything. So on this side, what do I get? Well, the limit as h goes to 0 of h is 0. And I multiply by that, multiply 0 by l, and of course I get 0. Okay, now I could do that on the other side, and I get 0 equals 0, and we would be not saying something very interesting. But let me not do that on the other side. Let me use one of our limit properties. Okay? We the limit property is said the following. If you have two limits that exist, right, and by assumption this one does, right, and this one we know exists. If you have two limits that exist and you multiply them, what can you rewrite that as? And if you have the product of limits, that's the same as the limit of the products. Excellent. So I can write this as the limit as h goes to 0 of h times f of a plus h minus f of a over h. And whatever this limit is, on this side, well, on, I know eventually it has to be 0. Okay? Ah, but this is very nice, right? h is going to 0, but it's not equal to 0, because in the limits we never let h be 0. So I can cancel the h's. And so I'm left with the limit as h goes to 0 of f of a plus h minus f of a. And it equals, well, the other side is 0. Just cancel the h's. Okay, now, can I break up this limit? I see some nods. When am I allowed to break up the limit of a sum or a difference? There's a hypothesis. Both individual limits have to exist. Now, certainly, as h goes to 0, f of a is just f of a. That exists. What happens as h goes to 0 to f of a plus h? Well, we want to say, oh, it just clearly goes to f of a. But that would be assuming continuity. All right? If we assume that the limit as h goes to 0 of f of a plus h is f of a, that's exactly what continuity says, right? As we get closer to a, okay, f of a plus h is getting closer to f of a. That's actually assuming continuity. So we can't do that. Because we don't know that it's continuous there. We don't even know that this limit exists. Right? We have no reason to believe that yet. 
But we do know that this whole limit exists. That's true. Okay, and it exists and it equals zero. Okay, so how can we get around this problem? Well, I'm going to add something which I do know exists. I'm going to add the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x. Of course, if I add it to one side, I have to add it to the other. We already know it exists, right? It, and it equals f of x. Right? This is just the limit of a constant. It's one of our rules. Right? And so what is the limit on the right side? Well, we know this is actually f of x. Why do I do that? Well, now here's the cool bit. Okay? I have a limit which I know exists. In fact, it's equal to 0. And I have another limit which exists. It's equal to f of a. I add them up. The limit of a sum is the sum of the limits. Or, in this case, the sum of the limits is the limit of the sum. So I can combine this. And of course, when I combine it, I'm going to get f of a plus h minus f of a plus f of a, which is plus h. And it equals the other side. That's the thing. Ah, we've now proven what we suspected was true. Namely, that as h goes to 0, f of a plus h approaches f of a. And that's continuity. Okay? Another way to write this, instead of having h go to 0, have the limit as x goes to a of f of x. Okay. This, this expression here is the same as this expression. Right? As x approaches a, that's the same thing as when h goes to 0 of a plus h. Okay. And so we get kind This is very subtle. right? At this point, you really want to believe, ah, I can just break this up. Right, here, sorry. I can just break this up and just say, oh, that's, that's f of a as h goes to 0. Okay? But you can't do that. You can't assume continuity when you're trying to prove continuity. Okay. So that, that's the end of the proof. Okay, so this tells us that anytime you have a differentiable function, right, say it's differentiable at a point, it's already continuous at that. And remember, continuity was sort of our ticket into the club. Okay? And in the, when you went into the club, that's when you could just plug. Right? When you said, oh, the limit is x goes to a of the function, I can just plug a in. Okay? And that was the cool part of being in the club. You didn't have to worry about changing things around and simplifying and doing algebra. All right? You just plug the sucker right in. Okay? If you're differentiable, that's like being in the VIP section of the club. Okay? It's a little bit more. Okay, so first you've got to get into the club, you've got to be continuous. Then you get the VIB pass, and then you can find derivatives. Okay? Now, here's the, the next question, right, which is an important one from a mathematician's point of view, and by extension, now your point of view. Okay. Is the VIP section of the club the whole club? Right. If I go into the club, am I automatically a VIP member? Yeah. It's the same as asking, if you're continuous, are you automatically differentiable? OK, so let's, let's see an example that answers this question. So those of you who have a little pre-knowledge, okay, you know it, which example is coming, right? What function am I going to put up here? What's our, our the easiest example of a function which is continuous at a point but not differentiable at that point? Absolute value, Absolute value of x at what point? Uh, yeah, I guess. Uh -huh. Okay, this is the example we're going to work with. Okay. So remember what the absolute value function does. Okay. When it's negative, when the number is negative, it makes it positive. Right? 
which just means it's the function y equals minus x. So when you're a negative number, it just goes up like this. And when you're positive, it does nothing to you. Right? So it's just the function y equals x. And you hit the point zero, zero. Of course, it does, does nothing to zero. That's your function. OK, now let's think about this in a few different ways. First, is this a continuous function? Sure, right? OK, there's no question anywhere around here. It's always hitting its, its target. You know, over here is the same thing. The only place you might be a little concerned is at zero. Okay, but Sure enough, both of these functions approach zero as they're coming down. So the one-sided limits are both zero, and the function does take the value of zero there, so it hits its target. The limits both exist, it hits its target, it's continuous. Fine. Is it differentiable? Well, let's take a look at the slope of the line as you're coming in. Da -da -da. What's the slope of this line here? Right? Well, it's a slope y equals minus, I mean, the, the function y equals minus x. What's the slope of that line? Negative 1, right? So the slope coming in is negative 1, negative 1, negative 1. As I get closer, the slope is still negative 1, negative 1, negative 1. If I was doing this limiting process where I, I took a point over here and started drawing secant lines through it and looked at that slope, I would always get negative 1 coming this way. And if I went this way, I drew points and drew a secant line, I would always have a slope what? 1. No matter how close I get to 0, the slope is always 1. So the left-sided limit is minus 1. The right-sided limit is 1. They don't agree. So the limit's not going to exist. Okay, let's write that out. Remember, to check the derivative, well, it's this function I just erased, you have to look at the limit as as h goes to 0. But in this case, we're really going to have a problem if we don't do one-sided limits first. Okay, so let's check the one-sided limit. So the limit as h goes to 0 from the left of f of, let's say, just at 0 right, plus h minus f of 0 over h. This is equal to the limit as h approaches 0 from the left Okay, the function is the absolute value function. So I get the absolute value of 0 plus h, which is just the absolute value of h. Minus the absolute value of 0, which is 0, divided by h. Okay, what is the absolute value of h? Is it positive h or negative h? Well, let's see. What kind of number is h? Well, let's look. h is a sum number which is approaching 0 from the left side. All right, so it's a negative number. Okay, so what does an absolute value do to a negative number? Makes it positive. Makes it positive. How does it make it positive? How do you make a negative number positive? Negative. You multiply it by a negative, right? You multiply it by negative 1. Right? So if you have a number x, which is negative, if you want to make it positive, you look at minus x. Now that's a little confusing because you look at minus x is positive? Sure, x was negative to start with. So this is equal to the limit as h goes to 0 from the left of minus h over h. Okay? Well, we never allow h to be 0, so we can cancel, and you just get minus 1. And of course, that's exactly what you expect. Well, that's this minus 1 is the slope of all these secant lines right, as you let the point get closer and closer to 0. Okay. So just take a guess. When I do the limit, now as h approaches 0 from the right, what do you think the, slope, the uh, answer is going to be? It's going to be 1. So we get the same, everything is the same. Until I get to here and I go to take the absolute value of h. Now the absolute value of h, right? Well, if h is positive, what's the absolute value of h? It's just h. Okay. Of 
course, the H is canceled because we don't let H be zero, and you just get one. So a left-sided limit exists, a right-sided limit exists, but they don't equal each other. So the two-sided limit does not exist. This implies that the limit if h goes to 0 of f of x plus h, well, 0 plus h, minus f of 0 over h does not exist. Right? Which, in terms of derivative, says f prime of 0 does not exist. Right. Remember, this was my notation for this difference quotient at, at some point. Right? F prime of zero is the derivative of zero. I think it does not exist. So here is a case where continuity does not imply differentiability. Just because you get into the club does not mean you get to go into the VIP section. And you still have to buy two drinks. Right. Any questions about this? Typically, if you want to think about this geometrically, you're going to have problems with differentiability whenever you have this sort of a, a jagged corner. Right? Or other places you'll have it if you have some sort of a cusp, something like this. And whenever you have that sort of thing, differentiability is a real problem because if you think about it, as you get closer to that point, the slopes just, they're always going to be different. Okay, it just matches up. And it's because at this point, it's, it's not just some nice curve. Okay? When you have x squared, it changes directions, right? The slopes as you come in from this side and this side, I mean, this is a negative slope and this is a positive slope. But as you get closer to zero, it evens out and they both approach zero. Right? In this case, they didn't both approach zero because they, do, they don't kind of curve into each other. They just come in at this right angle. And the same thing happens here. They never kind of moderate, you know, loosen up. They just keep staying, oh, I'm going to be negative, or I'm going to be positive. Right? So whenever you have those kind of problems, right, you're not going to be differential. So uh, there's a really interesting example, which maybe I'll, I'll try to go out and, and find it for you and see if it's reasonable to, to show you guys. There is a function that I believe uh, Carl Weierstrass came up with, which is continuous at every point and is differentiable at no points. And the way he did it is he started with some function, which, you know, just some, it was like a sine function. And he just started adding jags into it. But of course, I mean, if you put a little jag in somewhere, it's only differentiable, or not differentiable at that point where you get the jag, right? All the other points near it, it's differentiable. You have no problem. I mean, the derivative here exists. Derivative here exists, no problem. Right. But so then he did another graph where he took the first one and he started adding more jags to it. And then he added more jags and more jags. And he did this infinitely many times. And so he got at every point there was a jag. So it was nowhere, it was going to be nowhere differentiable, but it was everywhere continuous, which is kind of weird. So that's, that's another one of those what we call pathological examples. It doesn't show up very often in the real world, but it's good to know you can do it. Okay, so continuity does not imply differentiability. Differentiability does imply continuity. All right, so now let's let's try to make taking derivatives a little bit easier. some rules for differentiation. Now, uh, at least for a couple of them, I want to prove these things. So I feel like I've done something mathematical instead of just giving you a cookbook. Uh, but these things aren't that hard. So the first rule says the following. Okay, well, let me, let me set up. I'll let f and g be function. So let f of x and g of x functions, and let's let them uh, be differentiable at 
at x equals x. And let, well, c is just going to be some constant. And this c being a constant, right, this is the same sort of thing I did when I defined rules for limits and for continuity. Right. Remember, the first thing I showed is that you could you know, uh, add functions and then break it up, and then the second one is you could pull out a C. We're going to do the same thing. Right. It's just linearity. Okay. So the first thing says, and I'm going to abbreviate here, uh, I guess I should write it correctly. If I take two functions and add them up and take the derivative, at a point A. Then this is the same thing as if I first take the derivative of each function individually at the point A and then add it. Okay, or in words, the derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivatives. Okay. You look really concerned. Sure. That the derivative of the sum is the sum of the derivatives? Yeah. Do you think it's not true? Yeah. Okay. Well, then, I, then you're you're saying that you need a proof. How do you even have functions like that? Oh, you want to know what this means? Okay. So, if I want to say, let's say f of x is equal to 2x, and g of x is equal to sine of x. Okay. I don't care what a is. A is just a. What do I mean by f plus g prime at a? Well, I mean first, take these two functions and add them up. Okay, so f plus g is 2x plus sine x. Okay, so this is a new function. I can ask, does it have a derivative at a? Okay, and that's what that is. You take that function and say, what's the derivative at the point x? Does that make sense? Okay. Just, it literally just means add the functions together. It's not nearly as hard as say, composing functions than taking a derivative. OK, well, let's try to prove this since Tong is skeptical. He doesn't believe. He thinks it's not true. He also thinks I'm an idiot. I mean, I'm reading between the lines a little bit, but I think that's what he meant. All right. So if we want to figure this out, okay, well, we better use the definition. Okay. We need to look at the limit as h goes to 0 of f plus g applied to a plus h minus f plus g applied to a divided by h. Okay, fine. Well, let's add one more line here. What do I mean by f plus g applied to a? Well, it just means I plug a into this formula, which is the same thing as doing f of a plus g of a. Right? Okay, that's what it means. It, it almost looks like some sort of distributivity condition. It's not. Don't, don't be confused by that. It just, just coincidentally looks like that. Okay, so we'll run out of room here in a second. So we just do one more line. Okay, so this means I do f of a plus h plus g of a plus h. Minus f of a plus g of a. And then everything is divided by h. This is why it's important not to think of it as distributivity condition. Because otherwise this would be, oh, f of a plus f of h plus g of a plus g of a. It doesn't work that way. It's not what a function means. OK. So what can I do with this nastiness?
Well, let's forget about the limit for a second. Okay? I have this nasty fraction. Okay? And I'm going to rearrange it. I'm going to write f of a plus h minus f of a. Then I'm going to write g of a plus h minus g of a. And then the whole thing's going to be over h. And then I'm going to break it up into two different fractions. So we're equal to the limit, h goes to 0, um, f of a plus h minus f of a plus g of a plus h minus g of a over h. And now I want to split it up into two fractions. All right, and just recall, right, if you have two fractions, if you have a fraction that looks like a plus b over c, this is the same as a over c plus b over c. Don't worry about the end. So I just break this up. So I get f of a plus h minus f of a over h plus g of a plus h minus g of a over h. Right, and the limit applies to this whole thing. Okay, now I want to break up this limit. Right? Limit of the sum is the sum of the limits, right? But what do I need to know before I can break it up into the sum of these two limits? Continuous. Not that it's continuous, but that these limits actually exist. Right? Go back and look at the limit properties. The hypothesis for breaking up a sum is that the individual functions, when you apply the limit, they have to exist in the first place. Okay? You, if these two limits don't exist, you can't break up the sum. Okay? So these limits have to exist. But if I break this up, right, I get the limit as h goes to 0, f of a plus h minus f of a over h. That's the first term. That's just the derivative of f of a. And what is our hypothesis? f of x and g of x functions, which are differentiable at x equals a. That's why I had to write that up there. It's so that at this point in the proof, I can break up this sum, because now I know that individually these two limits are going to exist. So this is the limit as h goes to 0, f of a plus h minus f of a over h, plus the limit as h goes to 0, g of a plus h minus g of a over h. And by definition, this is the derivative of f at a, and this is the derivative of g at a. Now everybody turn to Tom and say, nee, 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 nee. I also didn't appreciate the comments about me stinking. Huh? You guys didn't hear that. You questioned my personal hygiene. Says you look fat, too. Fat? That's actually true. Ugh. I'm sorry. I'm gonna go home and cry. Oh, can you? Cry? Yeah, I have tear ducts in it. So we can make them? Well, I'm not going home now. Uh -huh. No, no, misery loves company. Okay, so let's see. We started with f plus g prime of a. Right? That's what this thing turned into, and we received f prime of a plus g prime of a. So indeed, the derivative of the sum is the sum of the derivatives. Oh, look at that. I mean, this looks like real mathematics we're doing. Look at that. There's all sorts of stuff on the board. Like we know what we're doing. Okay. Yes. Do another one. Let's do an easier one. To the totally trivial one. Next one is going to say that if I take a function and multiply it by a constant and then take the derivative, that this is the same thing as taking the derivative and then multiplying by the constant. Now, what do I mean by CF? Now, let's say C is 2. No, let me make it 5. Or maybe 4. No, okay, it's 5. It's 5. 
What do I mean by CF of A? Well, I want three of you of A, actually. What do I mean by CF? By CF, I just mean multiply this constant by the function. So this is 5 times 2x, or 10x. Is that just for you? No, really? It's very special, man. Okay, so let's prove this. All right, well, the proof is easy. We just look at the derivative. The definition says this should be CF applied to A plus H minus uh, CF applied to A divided by H. Well, by definition, if you do CF applied to A plus H, that's the same thing as applying F to A plus H and then multiplying by the constant. So this is the limit as H goes to 0 of the constant times F of A plus H minus the constant times F of A all over H. Okay, so I have a C in both terms. I can factor it out. Now I have a constant times the remaining function. Okay, that's your remaining function. Yeah? Wait, isn't that using the rule to prove this? Which rule? What am I using? I mean, what, what, what am I using here? To, to turn this into this, you mean? Yeah. No, no, all I'm using here is the definition. Okay. That if I have CF applied to A, by definition, this is C times F of A. That has nothing to do with differentiation. This only has to do with the definition of I mean, what it means. Okay? Yeah, I mean, if, if I apply here when x is equal to 12. Oh, okay, I see. Okay. You get 24 times 5. It's the same thing as if you multiply, put in the function, make it 10x, and then put it in 12. Okay. okay. So I just use basic definition of what do I mean to multiply a constant by a function. Okay. Typically, actually, there's a root name for, for these sort of operations. You add functions and multiply by constants. It's called the algebra of functions. Right? There's another one which is going to be when you multiply two functions. And it's exactly what you would hope it to be. It just means you apply the functions and then multiply. Okay. Are we in? No. Very good. Okay. So I pull this C out, and I have C times this function, f of h plus h minus f of a divided by h. And I would like to pull the c out of the limit. Now I have a rule which says I can, yeah? Okay, the only thing the rule requires is that the limit that I get remaining over has to exist. But of course it does, because I assume that f is differentiable at x equals a. So, using the limit properties, I can pull a c out, and I get c times the limit as h goes to 0 of f of a plus h minus f of a over h. And of course, this is the, de the derivative of f of a. So this is c times the derivative of a. We have a full dot here. You know, we're first evaluating the derivative, then multiplying by c. Okay. So let's do two examples. Or one. I don't really worry about numbers. Some finite number of examples. We'll let f of x be uh, 3x and g of x be, uh, okay, we'll use 3x squared minus 3x squared plus 2. I believe we evaluated that derivative yesterday. Okay, so what is uh, the derivative of f of x? Okay, at say 4. Okay, so let's see, what is f prime of 4? Okay, so 
this one, we'll just skip the derivation. Right? We know that the derivative is going to give us the slope. This is a line with slope 3. Okay, so what's the slope at any point? 3, right? So the derivative has to be 3. Okay, fine. So if I plug in the derivative at, at 4, I, I'm going to get 12. Alternatively, okay, I could say, okay, well, let me use this alternative notation. The derivative of 3 of that 3x would it just be 3? Yeah, of course it is. Okay. Well, how is it 12? It's not. I don't know what you're talking about. Why are you, why, why are you mentioning 12? Is there something wrong? Okay, so the derivative here is 3. Okay, fine. On the other hand, let's say I write down, uh, let me call it h of x equal to x. There's another function. Then I know that f of x is equal to 3 times h of x. Which means that the derivative, in general, of f of x, or let's say we'll do it at 4, is equal to, well, 3 times h and you take the derivative of 4. Because right? f, right? f is equal to 3 times h. So I can replace f by 3h and then take the derivative. By this rule that says I can pull out a constant, this is 3 times h prime of 4. Okay, now, what is h prime? Well, here you have a slope with line 1. So h prime of 4 is just going to be 1. So this is equal to 3 times 1, which is 3. So you get the same answer. Okay, good. That works. Okay. Let's add a couple of functions. Okay. Let's say I want to do now the derivative of f plus g at the point 4. So this is now the derivative of minus 3x squared plus 3x plus 2, okay, which formally we haven't done yet. We've done the derivative of 3x, and this is the one we did yesterday. Right. Although, does anybody remember what point we did it at? Was it 3? Okay, let's assume it was 3. So let me change the uh, point to 3. Then I know we've done, we've calculated the derivative for sure. Okay? So, by the rule that we proved, we know that this is going to be f prime of 3 plus g prime of 3. Right? Without having actually computed the derivative of this whole function, we know we can break it up. Okay? And check it this way. And f prime of 3, well, for the same reason f prime of 4 was 3, f prime of 3 is 3. And the derivative of this at 3, I think, was minus 18. We get minus two. Very good. So we can use the fact that we know some derivatives to find the derivatives of new functions just by using this first problem. Okay. Now, there's nothing special about applying this to a point. These functions are differentiable at every point. Okay. And well, if we had been careful, we actually could have computed the derivative more generally without, with regard to a point, and then we'd have a, a more general formula. Okay, so let's, let's quickly do that with, say, this function. So instead of actually choosing my point A, I'm just going to let a variable go in there. Okay. I'm going to do this for any point x. Okay, fine. Okay, this function is minus 3x squared plus 2. Okay, you apply in x plus h. We're, it's the same derivation we did yesterday, only now we don't have a 3 here, we have an x. So when you do that, you're going to get, let's see, minus 3 times x plus h squared minus, uh, oh, we've got the plus 2. 
minus uh, f of x is minus 3x squared plus 2. Okay, so we're going to do a bunch of algebra. Okay, and what's going to happen when we do a bunch of algebra? Well, we're going to see the same thing we saw yesterday. All right, you're going to get an x squared times minus 3. Okay, that's going to cancel with this plus 3x squared. Uh, you're going to get a minus 3h squared. Uh, that's going to stick around. You're going to get a, what is a, a minus 6xh. That's going to stick around. You're going to have a plus 2. You're going to have a minus 2. Those are going to cancel out. Okay, I'll save you the the horror of doing algebra. So you get minus 6xh uh, minus 3h squared over h. Okay. There's an h in each of these terms, which we pull out. We cancel an h. And so you get minus 6x minus 3h. And as h goes to 0, this function approaches the function minus 6x, regardless of what x is. So this whole computation, we didn't actually need to know what x was to actually get an answer out. So we can write that the derivative of f, just in an arbitrary x, is equal to minus 6x. Oh, oh, that's not f, that's g. Okay. So this tells you, okay, if when x was 3, you get minus 18. That's what we knew. If x was 20, you get minus 120. Okay, so you can do them all at once. You don't have to calculate it point by point. Okay. Uh, we also know that the derivative at any point for our f was 3. Right? The slope was always 3. Nothing special about the point 4 or the point 3 or anything. So this tells us that f prime plus g prime is 3 minus 6x. OK, does that jive with what we figured out? OK, if you plug in 3, we're going to get minus 15. Uh, OK, so it's not jiving. So what, what's wrong? Oh, no, no, if you plug in 3, that's okay. That's somehow multiplying and getting minus 15 out. Eh. Okay, or minus 12 out. Okay, good. So you minus 18 plus 3, good, you get minus 15. Good, it works. Okay. So, the upshot is you can break things up. Okay, you don't need to, uh, you don't need to handle every single derivative as if it was a new derivative and apply the limit form. But what it does say is it would be really nice to know what the derivative of, say, a polynomial is in general. Right, here we, you know, we handled it for a, a square, but we had to do that. We had to break it down. You know, we skipped the algebra today, but we saw yesterday we had to do a whole bunch of algebra. So it would be really nice if there was some more general rule. And of course there is. Right? On the first day, we saw that there's something called the power rule, which is really going to help out. So let's, let's frame that discussion. Okay, so let's let f of x be a polynomial. So it's going to look like this. OK, and then some hypotheses here. A0, A1, so forth, AN, these are all real numbers. Uh, N is some natural number, possibly 0. That's what that little 0 down here means. Some people think 0 is a natural number. I don't agree with them. I think anything which was natural shouldn't have taken thousands of years of mankind to actually discover. And 0 came out very late in the game. So I say it's not natural. Okay, so we have a polynomial. I want to compute the derivative of that polynomial. Well, this 
rule that we can break up a derivative of the sum as the sum of the derivative says that this is going to be the same as looking at each of these individual functions and looking at their derivatives. another rule which says we can plot constants. So this is going to be the same as just taking the derivative of each of these powers of x and then in the end multiplying by the constant. So we've reduced the problem to finding the derivatives of just powers of x. That's why we want the power rule. Once we have that, we can do any polynomial we want. It's going to turn out later on that the power rule will be more general. It doesn't have to have just some natural number up here, but that's what we'll, we'll start with. Okay. I'm going to save the power rule for tomorrow because it's a little longer of a derivation. Or not tomorrow, I guess, because we don't class tomorrow, but next Tuesday. It's a little longer and it's going to require the binomial formula. Right? So I want you to go home and look that up so that you remember what the heck the binomial formula is. So when, I'm, when I'm talking about when I say that, is, uh, okay, so here n is some natural number. There's a formula which tells you how to expand this. Right? First, if it goes to 2, you have x squared plus 2xy plus y squared. And in general, right, there's some formula which is going to look at, okay, you need to know the binomial coefficients. And it's going to start at uh, x to the i, and y to the n minus i, and it's going to go from, say, i equals uh, 0. And so this, is, this here is called the binomial theorem. So the proof that I'll do utilizes the binomial theorem. So I want you to go home and look at this and remember what the heck was a binomial coefficient. And if you want, you think about this as the uh, i-th entry in the enthral of Pascal's triangle, but try to look up what that is and remember this formula and how to actually use it to write something down. To prove this formula in general, it's just a little tricky. So you need to be prepared for it, otherwise you'll be totally lost. Okay, uh, let's try to start the product rule. Because this is the first place where the derivative gets interesting. Okay, so we're keeping the same uh, setup where f and g are differentiable functions at a point a. Okay, or in general just differentiable, but let's we'll say at point a. And I want to know what happens when I multiply the functions and take their derivative. It's gone now. But this is what I was saying, when you multiply two functions, it just means you know, f times g of a is f of a times g of a. So if I multiply functions, take the derivative, what do I get? I would like to say that the product, that the derivative of a product is the product of the derivatives. Okay? It works for limits. It works for continuity. It's not going to work for derivatives. Okay? And it's, well, it's not super hard to see an example. Let's define f of x to be the function 1 and g of x to be the function x. What is f times g? What function is it? Well, by definition, it's the function 1 times the function x. It's x. It's x, right? What is the derivative of x? Well, x is a line, the slope 1, right? Of course, the derivative 
is just the slope of that line, so it's 1. On the other hand, Hold on, does that make, not make sense? Because if you're finding the, the derivative of f of x is in that zero? Oh, it's, it sure is going to be. Right? So 1, 0 times 1 be 0? Yeah, that's, that's exactly the point, actually. The derivative of a constant, right, that's just the slope of the line, flat. Of course, that is 0. The derivative of this is still 1. So f of x, or f prime times g prime, is 0. But f times g prime is 1. So the derivative of a product is not the product of the derivatives. Is not the product. So it's going to turn out what it is, is the function evaluated at A times the derivative of G evaluated at A plus the derivative at A of F times G evaluated at A. And so it's worse. It's not horrible, but it's worse. Okay, so let's see, do we have enough time? Well, maybe, we'll start it. We'll see if we can figure it out. Let's try to prove this. Okay, so we need to look at the limit as h goes to zero. Uh, well, okay, I did this for a, but let's just, I mean, we can write the formula down for any, anything. Okay, so we'll try to prove the most general formula we can. Uh, let's see, we want, okay, we want to take the derivative of a product. So we want f times g evaluated at x plus h minus f times g evaluated at x divided by h. Okay. Let's write out what it means. Okay, so if I multiply two functions and evaluate it, that just means evaluate each function and then multiply. So this is f of x plus h times g of x plus h minus f of x times g of x. All over h. Okay. What can we do from here? We look like we're stuck, don't we? I mean, we can't factor anything out. At least it's nothing obvious, right? Okay, so when we worked on trig identities, what did we do when, and we had to prove two sides are equal, and you start playing with one side and you get stuck, what do you do? Check the other side. Okay. So we're stuck here. Okay, so let's check the other side. So, we want to look at what this is. Well, this is, this is f of x times the limit as h goes to 0 of g of x plus h minus g of x divided by h plus, okay, now we're going to have, right, let me use some brackets here so we know what we're doing. Limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. Okay. And then outside this limit, we have to multiply by g of x. Okay, so we see anything we can do here. Okay, well, uh, one nice thing, this f of x is completely independent of h. Okay? So, as far as h is concerned, it's a constant. Okay? So, I can move it inside, because this limit does exist. That's our assumption, right? The derivative of g exists. 
So I can make this the limit as h goes to 0 of, and I can plug this f on the inside. f of x, g of x plus h, uh, minus f of x times g of x all over h. And then I have another one, and I can pull this g of x inside the limit. Oh, darn, it's still not what we want. Hmm. Hmm. Well, let's see. These limits exist, right? Because all I did was take the original limit, which exists, and multiply it by a constant. So both these limits exist, so I can put these together as one limit. Okay, so let's try that. And every step is like we only have one thing we can do, right? So much nicer when you have freedom, right? We only have one thing we can do. Okay, so let's put it together. Okay, so when I put it together, I'm going to have two fractions on the inside, both with denominator h. So I can put them as one fraction, right, with denominator h. So I just add it all up. So I get f of x times g of x plus h minus f of x g of x plus f of x plus h g of x minus f of x g of x. Oh my goodness. And all of that is over h. Oh dear. Oh dear. Oh dear. Okay. What can we do now? Can we cancel some things? Yeah. We'll add like terms. Add like terms. Okay. Let's make sure we got all the symbols in the right places. Okay. I think we're. I think we did it right. Okay. So let's see here. Uh, I have an f of x and g of x plus h. And okay, no like terms there, but and I don't want to factor out those f of x's and these g of x's. Those are just on the outside. <coughs> Um, but I should combine things like this. So let's see. I, this one has a g of x and that has a g of x. So would it help to, to factor that g of x out? No, because it looks like, I mean, these are the same terms. Hmm. So, because that, that can't help. So what can we do? somehow have to turn this expression into this expression. You know, I have an f of x and a g of x, and so the rest of it should somehow all become f of x plus h times g of x. So this is the first place where it's not just, I mean, all the other things, all the proofs that we've done so far, they didn't require any tricks. Right? It was just keep moving along and everything will work out in the end, right? But it shouldn't surprise you that there's going to be a trick needed here because everywhere else, all the functions, I mean, everything did exactly what you wanted them to. The sum, you know, of the, of the limit was the limit of the sum. Sum of the of continuity, right? implied continuity of the, the sums, right? Uh, and the derivatives that work too, but with products you get something funky. So, next time, I'll show you the trick. Okay, that'll somehow make everything come together.